Welcome to my coronavirus classroom. I'm Janessa Jacobs, and these are the reproductive systems. Today we're going to start with male reproductive anatomy and physiology. <clears throat> as far as both reproductive systems go, we can break the organs into primary and secondary organs, or our primary sex organs, and then all of the accessory structures. So the primary sex organs are the gonads, testes in the male, and ovaries in the female. And what makes them primary organs is that they are the organs that are directly involved in the production of sperm, oocytes, testosterone, and estrogen and progesterone. So our gonads produce our gametes and our sex hormones. So function of our primary sex organs is they produce our gametes and our sex hormones. We're going to talk a lot more about this, but in the testes, the gametes are the sperm, and the sex hormone is testosterone. It goes to the prostate and gets converted to a stronger androgen called 5-DHT, but we're not going to talk about that really. The ovaries, the gamete, is the oocyte, and the sex hormones are estrogen or estradiol. Estradiol is the chemical. Uh, it is our estrogen, so I'm going to say estrogen, the abbreviation is E2, and the other sex hormone that females make is progesterone, which is progestation. And it's abbreviated P4. So, those are our primary sex organs. Our accessory organs are all of the organs that are going to assist in reproduction in some other way then outside of producing our gametes and our sex hormones. So these will be the accessory tubes and accessory ducts. Um, <clears throat> so these will be the accessory ducts and accessory glands that we find throughout both systems. Today though, we are going to talk about the male reproductive system. The female reproductive system is quite complex, so we will worry about that for over the next two class periods. So the testes. We said the testes are the male primary sex organ, and they are involved in the production of sperm. They are the testes are situated inside the scrotum here. We can see the testis. This is one testis. And when we lead away from the testis, we enter the duct system. This is the epididymis that leads up into the ductus deferens. The ductus deferens is going to come into the pelvic cavity and meet this little duct called the ejaculatory duct, and that's going to lead out to the urethra. So those are our accessory ducts, and we will talk more about those in a minute. And then we also have accessory glands that are going to be producing secretions that are added to sperm to make up semen. So inside the testis is where sperm are produced, and they then enter the duct system and come up here and meet the first um, gland that you can see is the seminal vesicle. This is the prostate here. It surrounds the urethra. And then these little glands, right, not very well colored right here, but right here is a bulbal urethral gland. And we'll talk more about that, all of those as we move throughout our lecture. <coughs> And you'll see all of those again as we um, look at lab. So, <coughs> <coughs> the scrotum is the sack of skin and adipose tissue that suspends the testes outside of the body. And it does that because it functions to keep the body, uh, and it does that because it functions to keep the testes at a lower temperature than body temperature. So the function of the scrotum, we can say, is that it houses the testes and it keeps them uh, about two degrees lower than body temperature. And that's because spermatogenesis, or the production of sperm, requires temperatures less than 98.6 degrees. So you may have heard that 
professional, male professional bicyclists uh, for a while were um, quite sterile. And that's because they were continuously sitting on their testes and sweating instead of being able to suspend away and spermatogenesis wasn't occurring appropriately. These days they have seats with cutouts that suspend the scrotum away from the body so that male cyclists don't encounter that problem anymore, which is pretty awesome. So as far as the scrotum goes, there are some muscles in it that are also going to help to either suspend, there's one that can relax and suspend the testes a little bit further from the body when it's hot, and then there are two that are involved in pulling the testes up and pulling the testes back in colder temperatures. So there are muscles that are going to help, and the first is called the cremaster, and the cremaster works in both hot and cold conditions. When it's hot, it will relax, so the testes are further from the body. When it's cold, the cremaster is going to contract and pull the testes closer to the body or pull the testes superiorly. So when it's cold, they contract and pull the testes in toward the body where it's warm and we can get some body temperature. Um, so towards the body. And then the second muscle is called the dartus. And the dartus also works when it's cold. And after the cream master has contracted and pulled the testes up toward the body, the dartus is going to contract and pull the testes in toward the body so that we can also be closer to the warm body and get some body temperature. So the dartus works when it's cold and it contracts to pull the testes toward the body. And these are the 
site of spermatogenesis, which is the production of sperm. And so what we would see is this outer region out here is full of these stem cells. It's called the germinal epithelium. And males starting at puberty will produce stem cells that are going to be able to divide from puberty until death to give rise to a never-ending supply of sperm after puberty. So these purple guys here, we could say are stem cells, and these, or they're called germ cells, or spermatogonia, and these are going to uh, divide to give rise to continuous supply of sperm from puberty to death. Okay, so when one of these puppies divides, we'll give, we'll give rise to another stem cell that can go on dividing, but then it's going to give rise to a primary spermatocyte. And our primary spermatocyte is going to go through this whole process of meiosis, is going to go from primary spermatocyte to secondary spermatocyte, then we're going to become our little um, spermatids and ultimately become spermatozoa that are released in here. So the details of meiosis should have been covered in gen bio, so we're not going to go over all of that right now. But what we can say is happening as far as the process goes is up here in the germ cell layer we have mitosis and then as we move through these layers we're going to have meiosis which is going to proceed from meiosis 1 through meiosis 2 and that's going to take us from these little spermatogonia cells up here all the way to what are called spermatozoa or spermatids. So like if you were to walk up to your internet lab practical test and see a pointer here and it said what is the structure, what cell types are present, then I wouldn't expect you to necessarily point at any specific cell in here and know what stage of meiosis it's in. You could just tell me that we've got germ cells spermato <laughs> and spermatocytes that are becoming spermatids as far as that part goes. So that's everything we've drawn there kind of in purple. If you look at your figure, you'll notice there's probably some like, <clears throat> like tan or like yellowish colored cell and it looks big and blobby and you're like, is that even a cell? It's labeled. But it looks so big that it's hard for you really to imagine that it's a cell. So what's happened to our purple cells is that we're you know, our spermatocytes and then we're going to go through spermiogenesis and become little spermatids. So all of that's going on and that's being supported <clears throat> by these other large cells you see in some other color that have a couple names. So these are nurse cells is one name and they get that name because they nurse the developing sperm. <clears throat> so that and they nurture it. So nurse cells is one name. Uh, they are also called Sertoli cells. They're also called systemocytes. They're also called sustentacular cells. Sertoli so, cells are down here and they contain FSH receptors. So they're going to respond to FSH, which is the follicle stimulating hormone, and do a couple things. It's going to stimulate them to nourish the developing spermatocytes. So it will stimulate um, like nurturing behaviors. That's why, <coughs> behaviors from cells, that's why they get the name nurse cells, because they nurse the growing spermatocytes. So up here, our spermatogonia undergo mitosis to give rise to daughter cells that undergo meiosis. And as that whole process is occurring, these Sertoli cells are nursing those cells along under the influence of FSH. The other thing that FSH is going to stimulate these cells to do is produce this protein called androgen binding protein, or ABP. So androgen binding protein is ABP. <clears throat> and the reason we need to have androgen binding protein present is because we need to keep testosterone high in the testes so that it can stimulate spermatogenesis. If we didn't have androgen binding protein, 
being present. Testosterone would just enter the blood and do all the things that testosterone does, like stimulate the, the development of secondary sex characteristics, or stimulate aggression, or drive libido, something like that. So in order to be able to stick around and stimulate spermatogenesis, androgen binding protein is going to bind it up and keep testosterone high. Now, of course, we have enough testosterone that it overflows the ability of androgen binding protein to bind it all up, and it can go out into the blood and do what it does, but that's just one of the things that's happening here. Another thing that's happening is FSH is stimulating the Sertoli cells to release inhibin. It's a hormone that is going to enter the blood and cause inhibition of gonadotropes in the anterior pituitary, specifically inhibiting FSH release. So we'll talk more about that when we get to the HPG axis, but for right now we're going to put that in our back pocket as an action of FSH. So it stimulates nurturing of our developing spermatocytes, it stimulates androgen binding protein production, it stimulates inhibin production, And that's kind of the important thing there in the seminiferous tubule. Now, still in the testes, but just outside the seminiferous tubule, we find another important cell type. These cells are called lytic cells or interstitial endocrine cells, and they are outside the seminiferous tubules. So if you were to zoom into the testes, you would see that there are lots of seminiferous tubules here. And in between them are these other cells, the interstitial endocrine cells, or Leydig cells. Interstitial, like in the interstitial space. And endocrine, they make a hormone. What hormone are we making in the testes? Testosterone. So these cells are going to be the cells that produce testosterone. And they're doing so under the influence of LH, the luteinizing hormone. So LH is going to bind to LH receptors on lytic cells and stimulate testosterone production. Now this testosterone is going to bind with our androgen binding protein, stay high in the testis, and stimulate spermatogenesis. So that's what's going on in the seminiferous tubules. So after spermiogenesis, the spermatozoa will enter the lumen of the seminiferous tubule and continue their journey through the duct system. The next place they go from the seminiferous tubule is this little tube called the reedy testis that leads into these little efferent ductules that are going to drop the sperm into our next part of the duct system, the epididymis. So the epididymis is important because epididymal secretions actually stimulate sperm motility. So that is going to activate that flagellum so that the sperm can swim. So at the epididymis, we can say we stimulate sperm motility, which means that we'll activate that flagella, uh, those flagella, and the sperm will be able to swim. So if you were just to grab a sperm from the lumen of a seminiferous tubule, or a bunch of them enough to, in theory, digest the wall, weaken the wall of the oocyte from the seminiferous tubule, if you were just to put that right onto an oocyte, it wouldn't um, be able to fertilize the oocyte because we actually have to learn how to swim. This motility is really important. So you're not reproductively competent until after you leave the epididymis. So from the epididymis, our activated sperm are going to enter this next thing called the ductus deferens, also sometimes called the vas deferens. So if you've ever heard of a vasectomy, that's the procedure in which they cut the ductus deferens and tie it off so that sperm cannot enter the pelvic cavity. So here was our testis that has our seminiferous tubules. Seminiferous tubules led to our retus testis and the efferent ductules. Those led into the epididymis. The epididymis is leading into the ductus deferens which is then bringing the sperm up into the pelvic cavity. So our ductus deferens is the last structure that we can kind of see some of 
in the scrotum. It's part of this spermatic cord that comes through the inguinal canal here, contains the ductus deferens and then the arteries and veins and lymphatics and nerves that serve the testes. So, okay. What next? Well, to finish up external genitalia, we can talk about the penis. The penis is the male copulatory organ, so its function is to conduct semen into the female reproductive tract. So it's the male copulatory organ. And it conducts semen to the female reproductive tract. So in your lab, you'll get to look at it more, but there are some different parts of the penis anatomically. The root of the penis, or the base of the penis, is up here actually in the pelvic cavity. And then the shaft of the penis continues outside the body. This is the glans penis here. This part is missing the foreskin or the prepice. Uh, the other half of the model probably has it. I'm not going to grab that right now. You can look at it during lab. But that's the penis. The other thing that we can see here is two of the three erectile bodies. This red portion right here is called the corpus spongiosum. It's an erectile body that surrounds the urethra and keeps it open during ejaculation. This purple part here is one of the two corpus cavernosum that engorges to fill with blood and produce an erection. So the function is that as far as the structure goes. As far as the external parts that we can see, we've got the shaft and the glands. Uh, the body is uh, up in the pelvic cavity. So for our external genitalia, what you can see is the shaft and the glands penis. This can be covered in the crevice at birth, um, or if you're circumcised, then you don't have the prepice, which is the foreskin. So the penis and the scrotum are your external genitalia. The erectile tissue that is in the penis, if we were looking at this uh, in a figure from our book, we would see that down here is the corpus spongiosum. And this uh, keeps the urethra open. And then superior to that, we have, they don't overlap like that. Superior to that, we have two corpus cavernosum. And they are the erectile tissues. What is their job? They engorge with blood to produce an erection. <laughs> so I should have them be different colors, but alas. You can look at it in your lab. All right. So, continuing then away from our external genitalia, let's go back inside the scrotum when we left the testes, we entered the epididymis, and then and this was where we gained motility. The epididymis is then going to continue to our ductus deferens, which is going to be part of the spermatic cord, and conduct sperm into the pelvic cavity. It's going to take that sperm to this little part of the duct system called the ejaculatory duct. So, epididymis, stimulate motility. Ductus deferens, store, conduct to pelvic cavity. And then from there, we're going to enter the ejaculatory duct. So the ejaculatory duct is going to receive sperm from the ductus deferens. So it's going to receive sperm from our ductus deferens. And it's going to receive seminal fluid from our seminal vesicles. So it receives sperm from the ductus deferens and seminal fluid from our seminal vesicles. It's just a short, tiny little duct. 
So you'll see on models that it's just a small little duct that is entering into the prostate. So because the prostate then is where sperm will enter the prostatic urethra. The urethra, let me see if I can draw a picture of these two. So here's our prostate. The ejaculatory duct is coming in from the back. The urethra is conducting urine from the urinary bladder for the urinary system, and it conducts sperm for the reproductive system. So we could imagine that this is the penis, and the urethra then is this long blue tube. I'm making the ejaculatory duct red here. So the ejaculatory duct is just a short duct that passes through the prostate, and it's going to receive sperm from the ductus deferens and seminal fluid from the seminal glands. So that's the ejaculatory duct, and then it's going to lead into the prostatic part of the urethra, which is then going to lead into the membranous or intermediate part of the urethra, that then leads out into the spongy part of the urethra that's surrounded by the corpus spongiosum. So the urethra has all of these different parts. It's got the prostatic part, which is surrounded by the prostate gland. During the emission phase of ejaculation, the prostate is going to squeeze in prostatic fluid. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The urethra then has an intermediate part. And this is passing through the pelvic diaphragm. And then it has the spongy part. which is surrounded by the corpus spongiosum. There's another gland in between here, the bulbo urethra glands that are going to be adding their fluid. Okay. So the function of the urethra is to conduct semen to the female reproductive tract in the, for the reproductive system, but it also conducts urine for the urinary system. We'll talk about that later. So I've already talked about all of our glands a little bit. Our seminal glands, or seminal vesicles, produce the majority of semen. Seminal fluid is about 70% of semen, and these glands sit on the posterior aspect of the bladder, and are going to add seminal fluid into the ejaculatory duct here, along with sperm coming from the ductus deferens. So here's the ductus deferens that leads into the ejaculatory duct, that leads into the prostatic part of the urethra. This is the intermediate part that leads out into the spongy part. So the intermediate part's right here, spongy part here, prostatic part of the urethra, now glands. We can see our seminal vesicles here that are going to empty seminal fluid into that ejaculatory duct. The prostate is going to squeeze prostatic fluid in, and the bulbo urethral glands have actually been active since the arousal phase, but they'll add a little bit more bulbo urethral fluid as well during the emission phase of ejaculation. So, seminal glands produce seminal fluid. And add it to sperm in the ejaculatory duct. The prostate is going to produce prostatic fluid. There's only one prostate. So the prostate produces prostatic fluid. And squeezes it into the prostatic urethra to mix with this other mix. And then the last type of glands we have are actually the first to become active. They're called bulbo urethral glands. So these become active during arousal. And what bulbo urethral fluid is going to do is it's going to neutralize the acidity of the urethra and lubricate the penis. Some of this bulbo urethral fluid is also going to be added to semen. So we'll talk about semen in just a
just a minute. But um, this is during uh, active during the arousal phase, and so uh, they release bulbal urethra fluid into the urethra. to neutralize the pH and lubricate the gland's penis. All right, semen. What is semen? So it's made of seminal fluid and prostatic fluid and bubble urethral fluid. Oh, I've got to write fluid over here. So I'm going to erase all the rest of this stuff but leave these fluids up. Okay, so bubble urethral fluid, the functions that I'm not going to write down again because they're right here, are to neutralize the pH and lubricate the penis. The vagina is also environment. So bubble urethral fluid is going to help be able to neutralize that as well. That's a function. Another function of bubble urethral fluid, we're not going to talk about yet. <laughs> okay, so first, seminal fluid makes up 70% of semen. So anytime something is the most, it's probably the most important. So this is 70% of semen, and it's got the stuff that is going to nurture or nourish our sperm on their long journey into and up the female reproductive tract. So it nourishes sperm. It uh, is also going to contain an enzyme that breaks the clot down after 20 to 30 minutes. So it nourishes the sperm and it also contains an enzyme that's going to stimulate reproductive smooth muscle contraction in the female, causing specifically reverse peristalsis. So peristalsis are wave-like contractions of smooth muscle, and there's an enzyme in uh, seminal fluid that helps to stimulate reverse peristalsis in the female reproductive tract, so that the ejaculated semen can be pulled up into the female reproductive tract and have the best chance at fertilizing an oocyte. So that's the next function we could say is that it stimulates reverse peristalsis in the female. And it contains an enzyme that's going to break down the clot. What clot, you say? Well, there are about 250 million sperm per ejaculate. So if you just let them all out willy-nilly like, they'd be going in all different directions. It's much more efficient to deliver one power-packed punch of a package. So you clot them all together with prostatic fluid, and then you have to break that clot down 20 to 30 minutes later when it's in the female reproductive tract on its way up. So the last function that we're going to mention for seminal fluid is that it contains an enzyme that breaks down the clot after 20 to 30 minutes. Okay, prostatic fluid sperm together. So it activates sperm and clots them together. Bubble urethral fluid is also going to be added during the emission phase of ejaculation, so we'll add a little bit more. And this is going to still neutralize pH. But now, as part of semen, it should be neutralizing the pH in the vagina, as opposed to the, the pH in the penis in the arousal phase. So, okay, 70% was from seminal fluid, 20% is from prostatic fluid, and the remaining 10% is sperm and bubble urethral fluid. That is semen. Okay, but here's a real question. 
Which of the following is considered a primary sex organ in males? A, the penis. B, the prostate gland. C, the scrotum. D, the testes. I would probably also give you E, all of the above. But the answer would be D, the testes, because they are the organ that produces our gametes and our sex hormones. Okay. The male sexual response is broken into three phases. And this is the one area in which the two divisions of our autonomic nervous system are working together. So the first phase of the male sexual response is arousal. That is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system, and during that time, the erectile bodies are engorging with blood, and the bulbal urethral glands are becoming active. This will lead to an erection. So the male sexual response, the first phase is arousal, and during this time, the erectile bodies engorge with blood to produce an erection. This is in control of the parasympathetic nervous system. Another thing that happens is our bulbal urethral glands become active. Okay, and then the sympathetic nervous system takes over for the other two phases. Ejaculation, which is a two-part process, and resolution. In ejaculation, the first stage is what's called emission. And during emission, this is really when we get everything secreting and flowing. So sperm is going to move from the ductus deferens up into the pelvic cavity. Seminal glands are going to begin secreting seminal fluid, and all of this stuff is going to move up and through the glands. So during emission, our sperm and secretions uh, begin moving and mixing. And then during the second phase of ejaculation, we'll have expulsion. And during this time, this muscle, called the vulva spongiosis muscle, is going to forcefully contract and propel semen into the female reproductive tract. So that muscle is right here, up in the pelvic cavity, and as part of the base of the penis, or the root of the penis. This is the bulbous spongiosis muscle. So it will forcefully contract and expel semen out of the penis and into the female reproductive tract. So the second phase of ejaculation, still under control of the sympathetic nervous system, is expulsion, and during this time, the bulbospongiosis spongiosis muscle contracts, and propels semen to the female reproductive tract, or a pyre sock. It's brain break time. This 
is a ball of mating newts. So not all animals breed the same way. And apparently in newts, they get into this crazy hot mess of newts rolling around. I think it's just one female in there and she's got all these males rolling around fighting and trying to get in there and fertilize her oocytes. This brings me to another interesting fact about sperm. I've heard that there are three types of sperm because of just situations like this. Cats are also animals that can have potentially get impregnated by multiple males. And like mallards are notorious rapists. So poor female ducks have to like fight off sperm from many males all the time. Why am I telling you all of this? Well, because it's fascinating and you needed a brain break. But how it relates to what we just talked about is that I've heard that there are three types of sperm because of this. So if your sperm is gonna be delivered to a female who could potentially have sperm from one, two, three, 20 other lizards, they're not lizards, they're salamanders. 20 other amphibians, man, 20 other salamanders, then you're gonna want your sperm to have the best chance at making it to the oocyte. How can you do that? If you have three different kinds who are working together. So the first kind, they're like the sprinters and they're really fast and they're gonna go as quick as they can and hightail it for the fallopian tubes and just be going as quick as they can. And then you have these other ones who are the fighters and they're going and they're just trying to like stave off other sperm. Like, oh, you're not gonna get there, you're not gonna get there. And they're fighting them off and fighting them off. And then the third kind, they're the slow riders who hold up the back. And that way everybody else, you know, if none of the fast ones make it because somebody else's fighters got them, then all right, fine. If the fighters are taken out and lose their way, then fine, you got the slow ones taken up the back. So it's kind of cool because then the male is producing these offspring. It's kind of cool because then the male is producing these gametes that are doing everything they can to ensure their own survival, which is pretty awesome. So, all right, that was your brain break. Back to spermatogenesis. All right, so spermatogenesis is the process of producing sperm. And really it's kind of weird because spermatogenesis is that process, and that's one part of spermatogenesis. There are two parts to spermatogenesis. Spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis. What? Yeah, it's weird. Spermatogenesis is the production of sperm. And it's got two parts, spermatogenesis, which has mitosis and meiosis, and then spermiogenesis, we'll talk about it in a minute. So spermatogenesis occurs where? What's the site of sperm production? The seminiferous tubule. So spermatogenesis is occurring in the seminiferous tubule, and if you remember, we said there was this germinal epithelium on the outside of that, and that's where mitosis is occurring. So in that layer, the spermatogonium, which are the stem cells for sperm, are going to divide to give rise to daughter cells that are still diploid, meaning they contain full chromosome content, and one of those is gonna be able to just be a stem cell. They can divide and do that more and more, and then the other one is gonna go off and enter meiosis. And in meiosis one, we have crossing over of paternal and maternal information. And then in meiosis two, we split it all apart. And at the end, we'll wind up with four haploid daughter cells that are different from the parents and different from each other. That's what's cool about meiosis. I'm not gonna go into the details of meiosis in this class. You should have covered that in bio, in your gen bio class. So <clears throat> what I do want you to know that mitosis is what's occurring in this outer layer, and it's going to continue from puberty to death for males. So, and what it is, is the division that is going to give us daughter cells that are still identical to the parent, and that they have complete chromosome content, so they're diploid. So mitosis, we'll say our spermatogonium, which are the stem cells, that are diploid, 2N, meaning they have two sets of each chromosome. These diploid cells divide to give rise to diploid daughter cells. 
One is going to hang out here and be able to divide more by mitosis, and then the next one is going to enter meiosis. And in meiosis, what happens is we get crossing over of genetic information, so crossing over of maternal and paternal information. And then meiosis. So now what will happen is we'll get a mix up of all of those chromosomes. And in meiosis two, we're going to split all of those apart. So we'll have, um, we'll come out with four unique daughter cells that are unique from the parents and unique from each other because of the way the crossover works. So this is why it's possible to have siblings from the same parents who look completely different. So in the next thing we could say is that we split the uh, new combination of chromosomes between four daughter cells. So now these daughter cells are going to be unique from each other and from the parent, and they're each haploid. So they're one end. They contain half of the genetic information. So the other half of the information is going to come from the oocyte if this um, goes and fertilizes an oocyte. So uh, we could say we're splitting the new combination of chromosomes between our daughter cells that are all haploid. So we'll wind up with four unique haploid cells. So what's cool about spermatogenesis is that you can start with one diploid cell up here and come as spermatogenesis proceeds and the little spermatocytes move through the seminiferous tubule, by the time we get down here, we have four haploid cells that are unique from that one um, diploid cell of the, in the germinal epithelium. So that is spermatogenesis. Now, spermatogenesis, the second part of spermatogenesis, after spermatogenesis, <laughs> is spermiogenesis. And what happens in spermiogenesis is the little spermatocytes are going to shut off all of their excess cytoplasm. So as they're moving through this seminiferous tubule, they still look like most cells that we see. So they're blobs with a big nucleus. And what they're going to do through spermiogenesis is really develop from this blob into like a blob that looks a little more like a sperm. And what happens ultimately is that they're trying to develop these three important pieces. The head, the mid piece, and the tail. So as spermiogenesis is occurring, they're developing these parts and shedding off excess cytoplasm and getting rid of unnecessary organelles because their job is going to be to swim through the female reproductive tract and hopefully um, penetrate an oocyte to carry on and help propagate the species. So what are some specific things that we should know about this? This head on the top grows what's called an acrosome cap or the acrosome. So if you look in your book, you can see a picture of spermiogenesis, and at the end of spermiogenesis, you'll see the nice spermatid has this really nice, well-developed head that's got an acrosome cap. It's got a really nice midpiece and a really long flagellum. So sperm are the only cells that have flagellum. They are the tail tails that propel them along. And what this so what all of those two things do serve very specific functions for the sperm. So the acrosome cap contains digestive enzymes. So you'll notice when you look at histology, the oocyte is a really big round cell. It's very distinct in an ovarian follicle. And so it has a thick cell wall that's hard to get into. So one sperm on its own cannot get past the cell wall of an oocyte. It is the combined effort of half of the ejaculate in each, um, going up to each ovary that is going to be able to weaken the cell wall of the oocyte and allow for fertilization to occur. So one sperm is going to get through, but you can imagine there are like 250 million sperm per ejaculate. So 
if a female has two fallopian tubes, two uterine tubes, there's a 50-50 shot of which ovary is going to ovulate. So in theory, when the sperm goes start swimming up her reproductive tract, half of them are going to go one way, half of them are going to go the other way. And fertilization really needs to happen in that upper third of the oviduct to be successful. So you've got all these sperm that take their journey up into the female reproductive tract, and they get up there and they encounter this oocyte, and all of them are going to start working together to attack this oocyte. And so you get like 125 million sperm. Well, not all of them, right? Because um, some of them, uh, if you recall, are fighting off other sperm and like oh, we've got slow ones coming up and back. But uh, half of our sperm on, are, have made it up here and they're all working together to weaken the wall. And so what's happening is it's the combined effort of all of these sperm rupturing their acrosome caps into the wall of this oocyte that weakens it enough so that one can get through. So only one's going to make it through and fertilize that oocyte. And now this one, this the, the oocyte is sitting here with half of the, it has the mom's genetic content. Um, and it's going to complete meiosis too as soon as it gets fertilized. The sperm had half uh, the dad's genetic content, so each of these haploid cells now comes together and can start the cell divisions that are going to result in what ultimately becomes a baby. Pretty crazy stuff. So, spermiogenesis again is going from this spermatocyte to a spermatid by shedding off all of our unnecessary uh, cytoplasm, and, uh, cytoplasm and organelles and really developing these things that the sperm needs, which is a big long flagella, flagella, flagellum, a big long flagellum to swim, and this acrosome cap that contains these digestive enzymes that can use to help weaken the oocyte wall. All right, we are almost done with the male reproductive system. So, okay. So the last thing we need to talk about for the male reproductive system is the hypothalamal pituitary gonadal axis. So I'm just going to really quickly run through a review of that. So if you recall, the hypothalamus is sitting up in your brain, releasing, release, and release inhibiting hormones that are exerting their control over the anterior pituitary. So what releasing hormone has an effect in this system? The gonadotropin releasing hormone or GnRH. So GnRH neurons up in the hypothalamus are storing GnRH in synaptic vesicles that are synapsing onto blood vessels in the primary plexus. When an action potential is sent down these neurons, they'll release that neurohormone, GnRH, into the blood. So it's going to enter the blood, travel through the portal veins, and enter a second capillary bed here in the anterior pituitary. So there are lots of cells down here, but the only cells that have GnRH receptors are what cells? Gonadotropes. So down here you've got all these little gonadotropes with their GnRH receptors. And when GnRH enters the blood and then enters the capillaries and pools around, receptors, they're going to be able to respond by releasing what hormones? The gonadotropic hormones, which are FSH and LH, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. The specific targets of these now you need to know. So FSH targets the Substant, the sustenocytes, I believe is what your book's calling them, the substantacular cells, Sertoli cells, nerve cells, I'm going to write Sertoli cells, and LH is going to target what cells? The interstitial endocrine cells, also known as Leydig cells, which is what I'm going to write. Why do these hormones stimulate these cells? because these cells have receptors for them. Solytic cells don't have FSH. Solytic cells don't have FSH receptors and Sertoli cells don't have LH receptors. So receptor specificity makes you a target. Okay. So what happens when FSH binds Sertoli cells? 
Well, they nurture sperm. The developing spermatocytes. They uh, are going to increase androgen binding protein production. That's going to be important for keeping testosterone high in the testes. They are going to stimulate uh, when FSH binds to holy cells, they're going to increase their inhibin production. Now, we've, I briefly mentioned this, but we haven't talked about it before. Now we're going to talk about it. What inhibin is going to do is it's going to enter the blood. So now I'm out in my general circulation, and I'm on my way back to the brain. And I'm going to get up here, and I'm going to come into the blood vessel network. And then what happens with inhibin is it's going to bind to inhibin receptors on gonadotropes, and specifically inhibit FSH release. So gonadotropes also have in in inhibin receptors. So what we can say is happening here is inhibin is going to inhibit our gonadotropes from releasing FSH. We'll talk about why that's important in a minute. Let me finish reviewing this. Oh. because testosterone is necessary for spermatogenesis. So this is going to stimulate spermatogenesis in the testes, and then testosterone is going to enter the blood and stimulate all of the things that testosterone does. So we'll talk about the effects of testosterone in a minute after we go through the negative feedback loop. Okay, so I'm going to let Chip explain the negative feedback loop to you. My hypothalamus is up here, secreting GnRH into the hypothalamal hypothesial portal system. It's going to bind to GnRH receptors on my gonadotropes. And they're going to respond by releasing FSH and LH. A moment ago, we talked about everything that each of these hormones does at the target cells. The target cells are in the gonads. The target of FSH are the nerve cells or the Sertoli cells. The targets of LH are the interstitial endocrine cells or the Leydig cells. That name, interstitial endocrine cells, tells you that they're in between the seminiferous tubules and the interstitial space, and they're endocrine because they're secreting testosterone. So we said that testosterone was going to stay high in the testis because of androgen binding protein being released by the Sertoli cells and stimulates spermatogenesis. Chip just told you about what testosterone is doing to the hypothalamus and GnRH release. So this testosterone is going to enter the blood and negatively feed back. So as testosterone goes up, GnRH is going to go down. <clears throat> well, what about this weird thing that we said that FSH is going to stimulate the Sertoli cells to release in 
inhibit. and inhibit FSH release. So inhibin specifically inhibits FSH release. This is going to be really important in the female because in order for ovulation to occur, we need an LH surge. The way to get a surge in only one of these two things is by really to inhibit the other one. In males, it's significant too, though, because if males aren't using their sperm, they don't need to be making a bunch of sperm, but they still need to be making homeostatic so when GnRH stimulates our gonadotropes, it's going to stimulate them to release both of our gonadotropic hormones. FSH is going to control sperm production, and we want to be able to keep that in homeostatic range while still allowing testosterone to go up so that it can stimulate all of the things that testosterone does, the development of secondary sex characteristics in males, and all of the things that are hormonally associated with behaviors in males. So as testosterone goes down, so if we have, let's just imagine that. So if we were to have a decrease in testosterone, then what would happen is we would negatively feed back here to GnRH and do what? If there's a drop in testosterone, the drop in testosterone is going to increase GnRH release. So if we increase GnRH release, then we're going to increase stimulation of our gonadotropes. But if I have enough sperm, or if I don't need to make more sperm, then I don't want to have to increase my FSH release so that I can come back to homeostasis with testosterone. So instead what I can do is by increasing the stimulation, stimulation of my Sertoli cells, I can increase antibin release so that FSH can stay lower, but LH can still go up, so that testosterone can go back up, and I can come back to homeostasis. I have a question for you. I've got to erase my to-do list over here. Okay, blank acts upon the blank to encourage the re release of follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Our answer choices are gonadotropin-releasing hormone, or GnRH, and anterior pituitary, testosterone, cystenocytes, which are our Sertoli cells, testosterone, and the anterior pituitary, GnRH, and cystenocytes, which are our um, Sertoli cells. So blank acts upon the blank to encourage the release of FSH and LH. Is it A, B, C, or D? Ah, the answer is A. GnRH acts upon the anterior pituitary to release FSH and LH. Okay, so what are the effects of testosterone? Well, first, it's going to stimulate spermatogenesis. important. Uh, it's going to stimulate the development of our secondary sex characteristics. What's that? Well, all the things that we associate with being male. Thickening of the, the, thickening of the larynx, lowering of the voice, increase in facial hair growth, increased muscle and bone protein anabolism. So secondary sex characteristics. These would be things like uh, larynx thickening, What this does is deepens your voice, <clears throat> increase facial hair growth, well, and increase body hair growth too, but increase facial hair growth. <whistles> An increase in protein anabolism. <clears throat> this is why males grow bigger than females. Estrogen is also protein anabolic, but not to the same level the testosterone is. So we'll increase protein anabolism in the skeleton and skeletal muscles. <clears throat> and since
since males don't go through menopause, <laughs> they do have an androgenopause. They do, uh, toward the end of their life, have a decrease in testosterone, but it's not nearly the same magnitude as menopause, and it doesn't happen as early. So males don't get osteoporosis as early or as um, kind of severely as females do because females lose the protective effect of estrogen for protein anabolism when they go through menopause. So those are our secondary sex characteristics. Some other effects of testosterone are behavioral effects. So I really wanted to believe that I was in control of myself and all of that. And then I took a hormones and behavior class and I was just blown away and realized that, holy cow, my endocrine system um, actually probably controls most of me. I am a wreck. I'm a slave to my hormones. And so is everybody else. So males, in males, testosterone stimulates an increase in aggression and an increase in um, libido. And how they figure this out is they can take, like, that this is an actual testosterone thing, not just, like, you know, something different, is that you can take a female rat and give her testosterone consecutively, and you'll see that she has an increase in aggressive behaviors, a decrease in nurturing behaviors of her pups, um, and an increase in libido as well. And then you can do the same thing. You can give a male rat estrogen and progesterone and get him to be all nurturing and lovey. So yeah, hormones really do some potent things <laughs> in our bodies. And so the effects of testosterone behaviorally, we could say it would be to increase libido, which is sex drive, and to increase aggression. <clears throat> you may not want to believe it, but it's true. And if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, like back in caveman days, we needed the males to be big and strong and aggressive and go out and fight for food and things. So, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. No, it's not. I have a friend uh, who actually had a friend undergo the full transition um, in gender transition, and the story kind of, I don't know, the story that I'm about to share with you made me feel uh, interested in this. So she underwent the full transition from male to female and after it was done she went over to my friend's house and they were sitting outside in beautiful Woodstock, New York watching the sunrise and she told my friend that for the first time in her life after she had her testes removed, this was the day after, she, or like the, the first sunrise she could rise after she had her testes removed, she said for the first time in her life she was able to enjoy a sunrise that every sunrise she'd seen before that with her testes and with testosterone, she had been worried or thinking and this and that and the other thing. But when she lost her testes and lost her testosterone, she was able to just sit back and be, which I really thought was kind of interesting. So that's just antidotal information. We could call that your brain break for the moment. Uh, and what else do we have to say? Nothing in this lecture. See you tomorrow. Female anatomy. Alex, you're not clocked in the spot. What happened? Alex. Mm -hmm. The doctor is in to fix this lecture. Welcome to my coronavirus classroom. I'm Janessa Jacobs. The doctor is in to fix this lecture. <clears throat> so we left off talking about male uh, anatomy. We kind of started into the physiology some, talking about the production. Really, an airplane right now? Blooper reel! What do penises and submarines have in common? They're both hard and full of semen. Okay, but here's a real question. Which of the following is considered primary sex organ in males? A, the penis. B, the prostate gland. C, the scrotum. D, the testes. I would probably also give you E, all of the above. But the answer would be D, the testes, because they are the organ that produces our gametes and our sex hormones.